All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca podcast episode, and uh, it is my privilege to introduce a brand new guest, Jesse Kaysen. Jesse, thank you for hanging out with me today. Yay, you're so welcome. Thanks for having me. And we, we managed to overcome some te- technical issues, and I think, I think we're going to make this happen, and it's going to turn into something quite interesting, uh, because we're touching on a topic in a way I don't think that we have in you know almost 500 episodes here in the podcast, and that is specifically <laughs> volunteerism. We've talked about charities and, and, and organizations, nonprofit organizations, this type of thing before, but specifically as it relates to actually helping your own business as well. You can help your own business while helping others. They can, these are mutually, I guess, complementary ideas. And uh, I, I think this is particularly important, Jesse, especially in, in light of the current culture and, and what we're dealing with in our industry because of COVID. A lot of photographers are probably like, you know what? I, I love the idea of being able to give back, but right now I'm just trying to keep my business afloat. Uh, you're suggesting that both can happen. Absolutely. Uh, I actually think it's important to not give so much that you run yourself or someone else out of business. That's ex- that's an incredibly important part of having a spirit of giving. Uh, and, uh, you know, just there's ways to do it. There's ways to do it right. There's ways to do it thoughtfully and without, you know, shooting yourself in the foot. Okay, cool. So that's compelling. And we're going to get to that in just a little bit. Uh, before we do, there are a few questions that I normally ask our guests here on the podcast. And the first has to do with brand position. And by the way, for anybody listening in, if you haven't seen Jesse's brand, her Instagram account, her her website, you need to do this because Jesse, I have to say you've got some of the most beautiful brand colors uh, that I've seen to date. Um, just I, I love you. how they pop off the page. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Ab- I love my brand colors. They bring me so much joy. <laughs> oh, they're they're incredible. And and actually, before we get into your brand position, just briefly explain to us how you came up with those. How did these come to be? Oh gosh, it's actually hilarious. So I um I launched my brand full time, just be, that being the only thing that I'm doing uh, in December 2019. Prior to that, I was working for other photography companies. Okay, and I um I picked two colors that I just kind of liked. It was a, a pink and a green, uh, and I I just kind of liked them. And I branded as that for about a month and a half. And I was after a month and a half, I was like, well, this is awful. I hate this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did a little bit more thought and color research. And I, I swear to God, I, I was just looking at some random page one day, not even related to my branding. And I saw a product they were selling it was a lanyard and it was orange and teal kind of. And I was like, I like those colors. And so I took them into Photoshop. I just took a little dropper on those colors, played around with them a little bit yeah. until I got something that I really felt strongly about. And took that information to my, my best friend who is a graphic designer who had done my logo. And I was like, what do you think about these? And he was like, oh, my God, orange and teal is so hot right now. (laughs) (laughs) So he was able to work that into my logo. And I'm super happy with those colors in particular. And I try to work them into my work a lot of the time, too. Oh, and you can see it, too. So for anybody listening in, uh, what I started to say a second ago is make sure that you go to Jesse's Instagram account. And it's very simply J-E-S-I-C-A-S-O-N photography, Jesse Case and photography. And um, you can see exactly what we're talking about. And yeah, it just really pops. You know, I was thinking too, as you're talking, I'm, I'm a very kind of black and white individual and my preferences, my personality, and even the colors that I wear. So I think that's part of the reason I appreciate this too, is I don't see a ton of color in my end. I love how this color just pops off the page. And there's a lot of character, not just innate to that color, but your style of photography as well. So I'm going to encourage our listeners to go check out uh, your work. But to that point, your brand, um, brand, you know, and part of what makes up brand or branding specifically is, is certainly colors. But when we're talking about a brand position in the marketplace, it's the thing that enables you to stand out in your local marketplace. What would that be for you? What is your brand position? So I am a Southwest Florida based photographer. I specialize in branding photography. And my brand position is that I partner with commercial and personal brands to create content that's as bold as they are. Uh, So what I hope to accomplish with that kind of statement is is kind of getting across the point, first of all, where I'm located. I think that's very important. Yep. Um, That I don't work with families and like squishy, friendly things like weddings. I don't do that. And (laughs) that I am bold. And I think the color in my branding is also part of what sends that message. I work best with brands that are a little weird, a little edgy, uh, and not afraid to try something really new to see if that gives that injection of, inc- of excitement that their their business or their brand needs. 
Well, and, and I have to, again, give you props because this is probably one of the most succinct, most clear brand position statements that we've had in the podcast, certainly in recent memory. Um, and and it's you, you did a great job of explaining it as well. In that brand position, partnering with commercial and personal brands to create content as bold as you, um, you do specify where you're based. Um, and, and I know that those of you listening in, you, you say, well, I didn't, you didn't say Southwest Florida. It's, I'm looking at Jesse's Instagram account here, and it actually in bold, it says, SWFL, so Southwest Florida brand photographer, Mm -hmm. and then that position statement, partnering with commercial and personal brands to create content as bold as you. So you mentioned the location, um, which is important on multiple levels. You you describe your target market, which is wonderful. You specify your style. And then you also, of course, mentioned the genre of photography that you're in and all in just this very short, simple, concise sentence. I, I think it's brilliant. Well, thank you. And I have to give you a ton of credit because your podcast episodes about brand position is primarily where I was able to hone this down. Uh, When I launched my brand solely full time, uh, I I was very, very confused about how to put that in a succinct sentence. I was doing primarily music photography and and band portraits. And and I was like, I'll still do family sometimes. And it was all very confusing. And, And really, honestly, this podcast was a huge help to me to getting a clear vision on what my brand position is. Oh, that's exciting. Well, um, for those of you listening in, if, if you're kind of new to the podcast or maybe new to the concept of brand position, uh, we'll link to to some of the brand position consultation episodes, maybe uh, in the show notes, actually, at bocapodcast.com for you to reference. You can go back and listen to some of those episodes and get a little bit more context to the conversation. But seriously, brilliantly done, Jesse. Um, Thank you. But I want to jump to the next question. Talk, talk to me about customer experience. Uh, as cliche as this topic may seem to many, especially those that have been in business for themselves for a long time, I really don't think that it can be kind of over discussed because it is really everything in the end. And I'm curious what big idea has driven the customer experience that you deliver for your clients? I think for me, uh, the most important thing is, is earning a client's trust especially when they're trusting me with their brand, their marketing. Um, you know, I'm up front with my clients. I don't have a marketing degree. I don't have a background in marketing. I have a background in nonprofit development and program management. Hmm. And so I, I'm very upfront with them about where my expertise comes from. And it comes from kind of being a young person in a competitive field and wanting to make sure that you stand out and make an impression. And so putting them at ease, getting them comfortable is is so important. And actually I dropped, I jumped through a lot of hoops to get my clients comfortable, to get them to trust me with their brand okay. and to uh, trust that I have a vision for their brand that is not meant to overpower their vision for their brand, but is meant to help coax them to think about it differently and to be bold. Well, you know, trust is an interesting thing uh, to me for, well, multiple reasons, but one one of which is I, I tend to be a, a naturally trusting individual, at least in most cases. And and some might even call that naive <laughs> because I, I, I tend to be kind of overly trusting. But what I realize and continue to learn really about the reality of, of trust as it relates to relationships with people, whether it's personal or professional, uh, is that, that some have had bad experiences in life, whether it's with Absolutely. a business or an individual and as a result, they've kind of put up a bit of a wall and you do have to work to build that, that trust. Um, and you said that you've jumped through some hoops in order to do this. I'm wondering if you can describe one or two specific ways that you help build that trust with clients. Absolutely. I think where I kind of start building the trust is in my uh, brand voice and how I talk on my social media, how I talk to people on things like podcasts or magazine interviews or anything like that. I'm very, um, I'm an open book about a lot of things. I'm very open and honest about my own struggles with my business, my own struggles with my uh, previous mental health issues, my upbringing, where I'm from. I'm very clear and open about all of that and how none of those things should be something to hold you back in your business. Hmm. Uh, and, and being sh- uh, open and sharing that kind of information with, is is a tightrope. If you share too much and then you're an oversharer and you freak people out, you make them uncomfortable, that's not a good thing. (laughs) Um, And if you don't share enough, then you come across robotic and unapproachable. So kind of walking that tightrope on my social media, um, being honest about, you know, who I am, who I'm, where I'm from, that's probably like the first step. The second step is once someone has, you know, recognized they like my work, they like the way I talk and they want to work with me, being totally on point professional from then on, you know, making sure that the process from inquiry to payment to setting a date is super easy, super seamless. They don't have to, you know, twist their ankle trying to give me their money. I make it easy for them. That also builds a level of trust. Um, And then the final stage of it is actually when I am 
setting up this um, expectation of when they come into the studio, I'm taking care of everything. While it is a collaborative experience for me and my client, I'm the professional, I'm in charge, and I'm going to be the one coordinating locations. I'm the one getting the hair and makeup artist and the stylist and everything together. I've got a solution to whatever their problem is, whatever freaks them out about Mm. having their photo taken. You know, I, they'll come in and they'll see all the soft boxes and I'll start cracking jokes and I'll be like, okay, so it's school picture day and you've got a giant zit on your nose and I know you feel awful <laughs> and they'll just start laughing because they start remembering like, oh yeah, we've all been through like yeah. a horrific photo shoot and yeah. I'll be like, this is nothing like that. This is just going to be fun and you're going to feel like a badass and it's going to be exactly what you want at the end of it. And if it's not, we'll do it again. I don't care. <laughs> well, I love that though, because it, it shows the awareness and the empathy that you have for your clients and that awareness enables you to be able to speak to these very things that they're concerned about or scared about, like, like you just said, and do it in a way that's entertaining. So now, not only are you easing their fears, but of course, what helps with fear is laughter in the end, and you're helping them smile and laugh in the situation. I, I think it's a, a really, really great approach. And you know, you mentioned too, honesty, and it's funny, again, I, not only do I tend to be overly trusting, but I, I think in many cases, um, I'm, because I'm trusting, I just kind of tend to throw everything out there. And I've realized that I don't have to just kind of throw it all out there at once. Um, Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to know everything. Being honest and being open and being vulnerable for the sake of developing a personal relationship of of some type, um, whatever the context, there is a bit of a balance to be had. And uh, I think that's something important to, to note as well. I think so too. I think it's kind of think about your client relationships as like first dates and what you're putting on the social media and putting out there the first time someone might introduce themselves to you is what information would you want them to know on a first date? They don't need to know all your childhood trauma, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but maybe just the character development parts that made you the cool person you are today. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Selectively share. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to me about time, um, time management as it relates to your personal life and your business life and kind of juggling that I, I know. And I think, you know, at this point in our culture, it's, it's wonderful to see some progress in the sense that the notion of balance um, has almost been thrown out, right? We used to talk a lot about mm-hmm. balance and the reality is that so-called balance isn't going to be the same thing for everybody. So it's not even the best word to use. I, maybe priorities are the, is, is the best word to use, but how do you prioritize uh, business and personal life so that, Um, You do have a life beyond work and you're Mm -hmm. able to maintain personal relationships as well. I'm one of those people who I kind of embody two personalities when it comes to work. On the one hand, I love work. I want to work all the time. It's my favorite thing to do. It's the only thing I'm really good at. And the other hand, I hate working. I love watching Netflix and going on (laughs) walks and not doing anything. (laughs) And so, yes, finding that balance is so important because if you if you give me the opportunity, I will work. 12, 18 hours in one day, and I will be perfectly happy with it. And then the next day I'll be like, oh man, I hate, I hate my job. I hate, why have I done this to myself? (laughs) So the, the primary technique that I've kind of put into place or philosophy that I put into place to, to prevent myself from working too much is charging a profitable rate for my services. Hmm. Uh, when you charge what you're worth, when you charge uh, a, a rate that will prevent everybody from flocking to you and trying to book you for every minute of your day, you have more free time. So I, I don't run myself ragged offering like mini sessions and specials and referral discounts. I just I don't want to get more clients. I, I want to get better clients that I that understand that what I do takes time, takes a lot of work. And instead of me working 24 hours a day for them, they understand, okay, I paid this person for a professional rate. I'm expecting a professional service and I'm not expecting them to be at my beck and call the whole day long. So I I feel like whenever I used to charge really small prices, I got a lot more uh, picky, finicky. I want everything and I only want it for $100 kind of clients. And when I started charging a profitable rate and making profit the primary focus of my business, I stopped dealing with those kind of folks. And then I had more free time, which was great. <laughs> well, they probably respect your time a bit more too, just because of where they're at in life. Because you know, I have every bit of empathy for for the the lower end market. Um, I, I certainly photographed in that segment of the market for some time, and and frankly, I come from that market. I mean, my parents made so little money, so when I got married. The the photographer that they hired was, I think, roughly $600, and that was a lot of money for them. So Mm -hmm. I understand there are a lot of people that exist in that segment of the income bracket, and that's just simple reality. And when you don't have a lot of money, you naturally are trying to get the most you possibly can for the money that you're spending with, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever vendor or whatever service. 
I, I can empathize with it, but I also know that because of those tendencies, uh, it could be very easy to let that set of clients kind of eat up your time uh, as it were. Yes. And so I, I totally get where you're coming from. Bumping those price points up means you're working with a client that probably at the end of the day also respects your time a little bit more. You're also making more for that time. And it seems like a kind of a win-win, but as it relates to time delegation is something we talk a lot about here on the podcast. Is it something that you've experimented with in your business? Something that you've found you kind of benefit from? Yes, absolutely. I, um, one thing about the way that I work and something is in my previous career, which was in nonprofit program management, I learned uh, something really important about myself because that was that was the first time I was in charge of something. Mm. I am an incredibly efficient worker and I can finish an entire day of work that would take another person eight or nine hours. Yeah. I can do it in two to four hours if wow. no one interrupts me. Wow. But that's not a healthy way necessarily to do your job. And it can mean it can mean burnout. It can mean you know exhaustion. It can mean making mistakes. Absolutely. It can be mad. God knows I made a lot of mistakes because I worked <laughs> that way. Um, and, but, and I would often like, I would finish all my work and I would just like fart around the office all day and everyone would get mad at me because I was bothering them. And which is very similar to my school experience. I'd finish all my work first and then get in trouble. <laughs> so, so since I know that about myself, I try to get, um, I try to set up my work day in a way that I get most of my work done in my most productive hours, which I know is between like 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Yeah, I'm like yeah. pretty much, I'm pretty much useless in the afternoon. <laughs> and so I'll try to power through those four hours, get as much as I can. If I work a little later, but no big deal. And then I will just try to structure my day around when my strengths are. And then as far as like delegating tasks, oh my gosh, I think any professional photographer, the absolute first thing you need to do is outsource your accounting. Don't do your own accounting. Uh, go get an accountant. Seriously. And then, and then after you've done that, what I did was I found that, especially during lockdown and COVID and all that, I was spending the majority of my time just nitpicking at my website, just change this and change that and play with this. And I'm not a web designer. I'm just a kid who figured out WordPress on the fly. And so I hired somebody to make my website, first of all, mobile compatible, because I'd been not doing that <laughs> uh, and to work on my website SEO. So I did the design and then she just went over and made it like an actual functioning website, which was great. And outsourcing that was was so, so helpful. Talk to me about an important book that you've read. This could be a self-help book. It could be a business book, something that's made a really big impact in your life. And, and certainly you could have listened to this. You could have read it, whatever the format, what comes to mind? So the first thing that comes to mind is the one page marketing plan by Alan Dibb. Ooh. Um, I'm not sure if that one, I looked, I looked to see if that one was in y'all's book list. And I didn't see it in there. Uh, that is an excellent book <laughs> and it helped wow. me so much. So much. And part of what it does is it's it literally, it's a whole book that teaches you how to make your marketing plan in one page. And it does, you know, it's not a very big book. You can read it on a weekend, but it really talks about the importance of, of you know, knowing your worth, setting your prices in a way that will attract the kind of clients that you want to attract, and then tailoring your voice in a way that's going to just, just be like a sales funnel every time you say something to somebody. So that's a fantastic book. Another one is is that one is in your uh, y'all's reading list is the building a story brand book. That yes. one um, taught me so much about storytelling and about how to use my experiences in a way that will bring in more clients for me. Uh, making them the hero of the story, I think, is like so important. And I, I try to put that in a lot of my social media content and my marketing content um, and their podcast also. So, so helpful. Let's do it all the time. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's easy, I think, to kind of make ourselves the hero of everyone's story almost, you know, in some cases, like the, the ego photographers um, can kind of get in the way. And certainly I've been guilty of it. But uh, the idea that we focus on creating this experience for the client where they feel that they are the so-called hero, and it may sound a bit cheesy to those of you who aren't familiar with the book, take some time to read it, because it certainly is one of the most impactful business books I've ever read. And by the way, also, Unlike a lot, if not most business books, um, building a story brand probably is like 80% practical information, and maybe 20, 15, 20% fluff versus kind of the other way around that a lot of business books tend to be. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just super, super good. But the one page marketing plan. Yeah, I don't know if I've heard of that one before. We're going to put that in the show notes too. And um, what Je Jesse was actually referring to for anybody who doesn't know, we do have a collection of the most popular books that have been mentioned on the show. If you go to Boca, B O K E H bookshelf.com, you'll see that, but certainly also take advantage of the show notes for, from this episode, for example, 
Um, if you go to the show notes, you go to bocapodcast.com and this episode, you're going to see the talking points. You're going to see the references to the books and other resources that make it mentioned. Make sure you take advantage of that as well. And that, that's really great. One page marketing plan. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Another great thing about that book, I think, is it's it really focuses on the importance of just standing out in your field. Yeah. And uh, I had a conversation with a friend recently about this because he was kind of, he was a burgeoning phot- photographer and he was like, when do I start charging? And I was like, when you're better than me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was kind of a joke, but I was like, but until you offer something that no one else in this market is offering, you're not going to make any money. You're just going to be spinning your wheels. So develop something that people are going to want to go to you and only you for, and then you've got a marketing plan right there. So yeah. It's a great book for that. <laughs> well, and, and you know that's that ties back to that idea of the brand position too. And the whole idea. It's one thing to say. I mean, we could say, for example, or if, if I, in fact, I'm getting ready to launch my photography business again here in Chattanooga, and I could say cool. I am a wedding photographer in Chattanooga. That is certainly a brand position statement, but it does nothing to share how I'm different from any other wedding photographer in Chattanooga. And that's where I think the biggest value of the brand position lies is if we've actually come up with a way. To your point, Jesse to do something different in the market, to, to fill mm-hmm. a niche that hasn't been filled or meet a need that hasn't been met yet and communicate that as part of the brand position statement, that's where the biggest value lies and it's so, so important. So yeah, we'll, we'll make sure to link to that book in the show notes. And uh, for those of you listening in, um, this episode is going to come out probably re- around February sometime, still early in the year. Good time to put together a marketing plan for your business year if you haven't done so yet. So make sure you take advantage of that book. Um, let's let's get to the main conversation at hand, though, and um, likely we're gonna we're gonna title this episode "Volunteerism: Helping Your Business by Helping Others." Because again, as we said at the very outset of the conversation, both things can happen. I think that's really wonderful. But on your your website, um, you actually say, "My biggest passion beyond work is volunteerism." There are so many fantastic nonprofit organizations in my community, and I try to get involved as much as possible. I know that you said you were involved in a nonprofit previously, but I'm curious what kind of uh, belief system, if, if for lack of a better phrase here, drives your passion for volunteerism in the first place? I come from a family that was living well below the poverty line mm. in East Texas. Yeah. Uh, it was a sing- single parent household. My father passed away when I was younger. My mother had a lot of mental health problems, a lot of pro- issues. And so we were often the recipients of charitable giving, uh, which was great and a blessing. And, we, and you know, I'm glad that we had that. Yeah. Um, but when I was probably, you know, 14, 15, 16, uh, I learned that you get so much more from giving to other people, even Mm. when you are the recipient. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes when you are the recipient of charitable giving, you can start to feel less than you can start to feel like um, you've been put in an othered group of like pitiful people, which is not the goal of charitable giving, but it can happen. And when you are empowered to also give, when you are told, like, even though you don't have a lot of money, you still have something you can do. I used to walk around my town and knock on people's doors and just ask if they were doing okay. (laughs) And then I would go to the nursing home in my town and I would go and sit and read with older people and just hang out with them for the day. And this was something that I did with my friends. This was our idea of a fun Saturday afternoon. And, um, but it was something that my friends and I believed was important for our community. We lived in a really small town. There weren't nonprofits in that town to help people. And it was very much so a, you come together as a community and you help each other. Um, and I was really grateful to be raised in an environment like that. When I begot, got, got to adulthood and I got the opportunity to work for a nonprofit, I was like, oh, yes, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is so exciting. Um, And I got to run a program. I was the um, I was a camp director. Actually, I ran a camp for adults with disabilities. Wow. And we would go canoeing and kayaking, and water skiing and horseback riding. And we took anybody, regardless of what kind of disabling condition they might have. Mm. And it was amazing. And I always got such an amazing feeling out of doing that kind of work. And I also learned the absolute invaluable presence of volunteers. I could not run that program Mm. without 50 volunteers because my budget was tiny and I couldn't afford to hire very many people. (laughs) And so, yeah, so it's just pretty much a matter of, of your, your community where you live needs you. It needs you. It cannot function without good people helping each other, whether Mm. you live in a big city or a small town, we are all needed to save our own little worlds. And that's, that's pretty much where my spirit of it comes. 
I love that. And just to be clear, I, you know, I asked what your belief system is. I think a lot of people associate that phrase belief system with something religious. And, and I'm not mm-hmm. referring to anything religious in particular. I, I've mentioned before in the podcast that I have a, a tattoo on my left arm, the inside of my left uh, wrist, which is the Japanese word kakushin. And that mm-hmm. is the word belief. Mm-hmm. And, and what I've learned personally and what has enabled me to continue to, to learn and grow as an individual is that if, if I understand uh, my own belief system and make changes to that belief system that enable my kind of big picture goals, my value system, my values, what I want to ultimately achieve as an individual, um, then I can very much accomplish those things. Mm-hmm. Literally everything that we do is driven by a belief or a set of beliefs. You know, whether it's I sit down on a chair, I believe it's going to hold me up. Or in, in your case, Jesse, you believe that our, our system, our culture, our society can't function without everybody getting involved in one form or another and and helping those around them. And that has ultimately driven you to not only, of course, be involved in a nonprofit, but then also since as a photographer looking for ways to continue to volunteer. And I think it's a really beautiful thing. So I just wanted to give a little bit of context to that, to that phrase there. Um, You know, leading up to our conversation today, you talked about, you actually said um, that you wanted to talk about volunteerism, but specifically as it relates to growing business, building a portfolio and enhancing a brand without undercutting other photographers. So I'm going to break down each of those points. Let's start with the specific ways that volunteerism enables business growth. So I think one important point is whenever I started out as a new photographer and whenever anyone who has ever come to me for photography advice has, is just starting out, their big question is, how do I get clients? How do I get people to pay me to do this? I don't have any money for running ads. Mm. I can't afford a website yet. How can I reach new people? And the answer is volunteerism. Volunteerism is the ultimate networking opportunity. Mm. I have gotten so many clients just through volunteering my services um, not just my photo skills, but also my time, uh, you know, going out and doing something for a nonprofit that's not just taking photos, but but also through for, through photography. Um, I actually just photogra- photographed a client last month who came to me and paid my full price and was thrilled to work with me because I had just volunteered to take her sister's headshot and her sister was running for mayor. Oh, wow. And I happened to have my office upstairs from the Democratic office headquarters. So yeah. I'm always down there going, anyone need photos? Come see me. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And so, yeah. And I, um, it's, you know, and she, she was super happy. I had another one. There's a local nonprofit. Uh, they provide grief support for children who have lost a, a parent or mm. a caregiver. Wow. And I used to volunteer to just lead groups with those kids because I experienced that myself. So yeah. I work with the kids yeah. and I did some follow from I, they actually hired me to do photography, so I and they had a grant, so I accepted it. Um, but I'm doing some more for them this month. But after I did the first round of photography for them, their website designer called me to thank me for the photos because it made his job easier and to refer a band to me because he was like, Oh, my brother's in a band, he needs photos. <laughs> and so, so it's great. So I'm still attracting like my ideal client. Yeah. My ideal client is people who care about other people. Mm. So that's part of their, their client profile. So doing this helps me reach those kind of folks. So, so number one is really the networking opportunity. People will meet you. They'll say, Oh, this person is such a nice person and I can trust them with my photos. I'm going to hire them. Very, very rarely do I get, oh, this person gave us free photos. Maybe I can get more free photos out of them. I never get that. I always get the hiring thing. And I think partly is because I do come in and I set it up as, hi, I'm donating my photography. Yeah. This is a donation. It is donated. And that way they understand. <laughs> that By the way, it's a donation. A <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I try to make that clear without being like a weird jerk about it. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but usually it comes across just fine. The other part of it and how it can help your business is um, it, it is another way that you can put your values into your business publicly. So if what you really, really care about in your business is uh, volu- or donating or um, adopting animals as opposed to buying them from a shelter and you're a pet photographer and you partner with a shelter, then that's going to just let people know like what your values are, what kind of person you are. And then that broadcasts to them the message that they can then internalize and think, oh, do I want to work with that person? Heck mm. yeah, I do. They're yeah. a really nice person. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so it's a marketing technique as well. Sure. Um, and yeah, so, but the, the biggest thing is, is really um, the networking, bringing more clients, and then the the final thing I think is the importance of not undercutting other photographers. Um, and that's something that's a little bit of a touchy issue. Um, when you're first starting out, it's very tempting to charge very, very little because you don't have the experience. You can't guarantee the product. You don't feel like you're worth it. Um, but 
what can happen often is um, you end up do, taking work away from working photographers on accident, not on purpose, not maliciously. And an example that I saw of that this year was um, during the pandemic, a lot of high school seniors didn't get to do their seniory things that they get to do every year. And I saw a ton of photographers offering free senior portraits for those seniors as a way to give back and a way to do something nice. And their heart is 100% in the right place. And then the problem, though, is that a lot of those seniors that would have probably spent money on a senior portrait photographer didn't because they got free photos. And so that kind of it's doing a nice thing for one family and doing a very not nice thing for a business mm. and making that business hurt because you're trying to do something nice. There's just more strategic, better ways to funnel that instinct to do nice things for your community, such as volunteering your photography to help a nonprofit show what they do, show them interacting with the people they serve, that sort of thing, or volunteering your actual time and going out and physically helping someone besides just doing photos. I just think those are better ways than than um, taking business away from other photographers. <laughs> yeah, it's such a, I mean, that's a, it is a touchy subject. You're right. Um, I get why some photographers may be upset at the possibility that they lost business. Although I would, I don't know, like in, in that case, I'm also wanting to kind of push back and be like, wait, that's one person that, by the way, this photographer was doing something nice for. Yeah. Uh, and so you missed out on that client. Meanwhile, there are hundreds or thousands of other potential clients in your city that you could go to. So the idea that they'd be complaining in that context um, annoys me a little bit, but at the same time, oh, yeah. I, I, I get it. Right? I'm just Absolutely. kind of playing devil's advocate here, but no, and you're hundred percent right. And it's one of those things where if I'd just seen it once, I would have been like, Oh, it's just that one person. Yeah. But I, I, I was, especially during quarantine, I was in way too many Facebook groups, which uh, I'm no longer in because they're a huge time suck, sure. but I saw it happening dozens of times. And I was like, Oh, free. They're all free. Oh gosh. You, none of you made any money on this. Don't, aren't you guys, are you guys out of work right now? I'm a little concerned about you giving away so much free work. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it's, it comes from that instinct of wanting to help, which is awesome. I just feel like there are better and more productive ways. You know, that senior client that got free, free photos from you is probably not going to refer anybody else to you except for other people who want free photos, which is not necessarily the best unless that becomes part of your brand. If part of your brand is you give um, low income high school seniors free photos, that's fantastic. Sure. Go partner with the Boys and Goys, Girls Club, yeah. go partner with a local other youth center that works with those for the, that demographic of kids and set up a program. That's actually something I did when I was first starting out. I thought I wanted to do senior portraits. Um, so I partnered with a local nonprofit and I did some senior portraits for them. Hmm. And I wasn't quite on my marketing game at that point yet. So I didn't get any referrals, but I got the good fuzzy feelings, which was really nice. <laughs> right. I actually got to see uh, one of the kids, his mom broke down in tears. She oh. was so grateful because wow. she had never had a professional photo of her son. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I am so happy I could do that for you. And yes. it made me feel amazing. So. Well, you know, so I, this, I guess, kind of begs uh, another question, which is, I mean, we were talking about here how to do things that will ultimately build your business. And I think you're highlighting really, again, just this wonderful balance between uh, opportunity to be able to build a portfolio, which we'll actually talk a little bit more specifically about here in a second, uh, but also gain access to a group of potential clients by mm -hmm. focusing on giving back. But mm -hmm. to that end, and to avoid maybe or at least minimize uh, the possibility of offending other photographers and, and making them feel like they've been undercut, what are some of the, the first organizations that you would suggest a photographer goes to to look for opportunities like this to work with, to work through? I think think about, first of all, who your ideal client is and where they give their time, if they are the kind of folks that give their time. Okay. Um, if you can identify that, that is a good place to start. So um, I'm thinking if you're wanting to reach business owners, maybe you should join or volunteer for the Rotary or Kiwanis or one of those other kind of like charitable groups that attract kind of older business folks. Sure. Um, if you're wanting to help uh, or if you're wanting to reach um, more like families, there's a whole lot of different nonprofits that help like low income families, but not just low income families. There's some that are just like nonprofits that help single moms or nonprofits that help kids that are struggling in school or after school programs, things like that. Um, there's always, an, I mean, not always, but in a lot of ag communities, there's going to be a community center where kids can go after school to like play basketball, go swimming, going and talking to those sort of nonprofits and just saying like, hey, how can I help? Can I do photos to show the community what you guys do? Um, anything like that. I even did some for a while for the local Humane Society, um, not because I wanted to bring in more pet 
portrait clients or anything, but I just thought it would help them. And so I did. And, um, and it was wonderful. You know, I got to spend some time with dogs and cats and I got to help them get adopted. And I, you know, it did help build my portfolio a little bit, but I wasn't very good yet. So I don't use that stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to jump to the portfolio piece here as we kind of finish our conversation, I'm, I'm curious, you know, as it relates to working with nonprofits and organizations that ultimately do benefit those that are in need in one form or another, photographing for those groups, you may have the opportunity to photograph a wide variety of genres and Mm -hmm. a wide variety of subjects. They may not necessarily help build a portfolio that's reflective of your specific brand. I mean, and you've got, I I can't emphasize enough. um, And again, for everybody listening in, if if you go to Jesse's site, if you just go to jessiecason.com, J-E-S-I-C-A, son.com uh, go to portfolio and look for example the personal brand photography i'm on the page right now and this stuff is just so vibrant i mean i, I really you. really love it um, <laughs> it you. really pops and it's beautifully done and your your knowledge of lighting and i'm sure we could do like a, at least another episode if not more just on that topic because it also <laughs> seems to be quite just diverse in the way that you're using it it's, it's really I stunning love lighting lighting's my favorite thing <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm super impressed genuinely but um all that to say i mean you're you've got a pretty specific style of photography that you offer through your brand professionally yes. how do you make this this volunteerism work that you're doing and the images that you get from that work with your por- specific portfolio So I, like most photographers, developed my style over the course of years. And I first picked up a camera in, gosh, probably 2008. It's been forever ago. And um, I have been developing. I wasn't sure what I wanted to shoot. And so helping me figure out what I wanted to focus on, uh, part of what helped me with that was my volunteer photography and working with different nonprofits. Um, I even I really thought for a while I wanted to do food photography. I partnered with a a local community center that was doing a cookbook from recipes submitted from their members and from uh, locally sourced goods from their community garden. And I photographed their finished meals. And I was like, this was so fun. And that in my portfolio helped me land a uh, restaurant who they hired me to shoot their entire restaurant menu. Wow. And I made a lot of money on that, which was really cool. And then I said, I didn't want to do food photography more because you had to get too many props and it was I can't store all that stuff. So, <laughs> but it, that, that has helped me a lot. Um, shooting food helped me learn so much about lighting because I was shooting in a dark restaurant at like seven o'clock at night. I had to learn how to light food correctly with soft boxes. Um, so it can help you learn a lot with your photography as well. Sure. It can help you um, try out different kinds of photography. For instance, if you are wanting to get into weddings, but you haven't had the opportunity to second shoot a wedding yet, go shoot some events for a nonprofit. Events are very similar to weddings in the sense of you've got to be quick on your feet. You've got mm-hmm. to know where to be. Mm-hmm. You've got to know how to light it if their lighting is bad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it, it can be a great way to build your portfolio that way. I've definitely used uh, event photography that I've done out as a volunteer basis to help me land other kinds of jobs. Actually, before quarantine, uh, I was being courted by a major credit card company to do some photos for them. Mm. And I used photos that I took of the um, nonprofit, the kids um, who are in this grief support group. I used photos I took of them as as a pitch. Wow. And they loved them. Oh, wow. So depending on how you want to inject your style into those volunteer photos, they can absolutely be part of your portfolio and your brand pitches. Yeah. Well, I, and I think it, it, you highlight a really important point too, which is even if those images aren't something that you can use directly uh, or directly relate those images to your very particular specific brand, it's definitely an opportunity to be able to develop a skill set and refine you know specific skills, for example, that you might ultimately still be able to use to enhance your portfolio in some way. So I, I just, I love your very, you've got this very proactive mentality, Jesse, um, <laughs> and on multiple levels. And I have a lot of respect for that. It's something that we don't always see in our culture these days. And, and I think it's really wonderful, but I, I also think this has just been a really insightful and helpful conversation. Um, certainly, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a funny conversation when you, when you start kind of mixing, the the notion of volunteerism or or donating time or donating money, but then also simultaneously talking about the benefit that you get from it. Um, I, I think some people may even kind of get shy talking about that, but it's just a simple reality that if we do make the concerted effort to give or to give back, there is benefit. At the very least, it feels good doing it because it's a reflection of of the values that we're attempting to live out. And in some cases, as you point out, there's even opportunity to be able to get business from it too, which I think is just, it's kind of like a win-win in the end. 
You know, I definitely get that it can feel kind of weird being like, oh, you're just talking about like what you get out of volunteerism. But that's why people volunteer, whether yeah. they want to admit it or not. Yes. We, all of it, I, we do it because it makes us feel good. Yeah. Well, then why not also get some other benefits out of it? And <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. No. And you might not always. There's definitely been times where I've volunteered and I've given a whole lot and I've gotten nothing in return other than the good, warm fuzzies, which is fine. Yes. I love the good, warm fuzzies. Yes. And that's why I'm ultimately there. Yep. Uh, I, I volunteer with the um, local juvenile justice system. And I work one-on-one with uh, first-time juvenile offenders. And I just kind of help them come up with a case plan. So they make sure they don't like commit crimes anymore. It's great. It's an awesome program. I get nothing out of it other than getting to work with a kid once a month, you know, on a program. Nobody ever refers anybody to me from that. I don't care. It's fun. The kids are awesome. And I get to help somebody. And I think with volunteerism, another big part of my philosophy about it is all of us can sit around and complain about how bad the world is and how terrible our community yep. is and yep. how the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Yep. But we can also just get involved and help people. Yes. You know, if you want to see kids learning more about auto mechanic stuff, go teach them. You know, if you want to see more community gardens in your neighborhood, go plant them. Like, yes. just go do stuff. There's nothing stopping you except no. maybe some laws, but we can get around those. <laughs> <laughs> That was said tongue in cheek, folks. She's joking. Yes, just jokes, just joking. Um, no, but you know, in all seriousness, that, yeah, I, I want to kind of throw in there, add to that. Just stop complaining on Facebook. Stop talking on Facebook or whatever social yes. media platform you you like to vent on, and just go freaking yep. do something Absolutely. already. I, that that Get really out is, of those Facebook groups and go do something. <laughs> do, even if it's something small, yeah, at least you're doing something instead of sitting around, you know, typing and complaining. It, it's again to your to, to what I said earlier, Jesse. Just this very proactive mentality. I have a ton of respect for it. Um, I, it may, maybe the last question, because I'm thinking about this as you're talking, how do you, it, it seems like you manage to have, maybe it's not a ton of time, um, but but extra time to be able to be involved in these organizations in one form or another. And again, a lot of photographers would probably say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed trying to run my business. I, I don't, sure. can't even imagine having extra time to go volunteer, you know, with this person or help that, that organization or photograph these things and do that. How do you manage to, to fit that into your daily schedule, your weekly schedule? I'm super lucky that I don't have any kids. I'm going to be that honest right okay, now because okay. I feel for the photographers that are like parents. Like, I don't know how they do anything. Children are such a time suck, but it's I, true. But I am very strategic about the time that I give. I schedule it, um, mm. you know, for like the the volunteering with the juvenile justice kids. It's one hour a month, maybe. Like it's just when they have a case plan meeting, they'll call me and be like, can you help? And I'll be like, yeah, I can help. And I'll be there for an hour. Um, for other things, it, it's just here and there. I don't do anything on a weekly or daily basis. Sure. Um, you know, there's some things that I come up that are just periodic volunteer opportunities. Like I volunteer with a community center or a community uh, foundation that goes grades, um, scholarship applications for local colleges. So I sit, I set aside like a week that I'm going to be doing that in all my spare time. And it's no big deal. It doesn't take that long. So just being strategic about it, knowing where your, your own limitations are, but also knowing that you're going to make time for whatever you're passionate about. And if you don't have the passion for that particular nonprofit, try to find something else, find something else that fits with your time schedule. Most nonprofits are super flexible. We'll take what you can give them when you can give it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Be intentional about it. And, and, yeah. and it's not, it doesn't, uh, I, I tend to be kind of an all or nothing person and I'm, I'm learning. Otherwise I'm learning to find a bit more balance in my life, but it doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? You can, no. even if it's just once a month for an hour or two, like you, you're doing something. Uh, mm-hmm. and that's ultimately what matters. It's that intention, the proactivity, and then the follow through. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can you can work it into your shooting schedule too. Actually, yeah. um, when, when we were reopening in Southwest Florida from the lockdown, I was real concerned because I was like, gosh, how am I going to get people comfortable like coming back in the studio and doing photos or like, what I don't know what I'm going to do. One of my best friends runs a nonprofit and I was like, how's, how's your nonprofit doing? She's like, terrible. <laughs> and I was like, cool, let's see if we can work on this together. So I ran my one and only mini session marathon of the year. And uh, I, I told everyone that was booking that a percentage of their session fee would go to that nonprofit. And oh, I got cool. booked out so fast and wow. I was able to donate a bunch of money to her nonprofit, which made everybody happy. So things like that can work out well too. That way it is a business uh, venture. It's a, it's a revenue generating thing, but it's also a donation to a nonprofit. Beautiful. You, you summed it up <laughs> wonderfully. Will you just remind our listeners one more time where they can find you online, social media, website, et cetera? 
Absolutely. So I am on all the social meds. I am at Jesse Kaysen Photography. It's J-E-S-I-C-A-S-O-N. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, TikTok, intermittently, and YouTube. <laughs> Perfect. And we'll put all that in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. Thank you, Jesse. This has been a truly lovely conversation, inspiring, encouraging. Uh, really appreciate you making time for all of us. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at bocapodcast.com. Make sure to visit our sponsors, photographersedit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.